It's going to get started this morning. Uh, I didn't realize I'd be teaching this morning until uh, a couple hours ago, but I'm glad that I'll be teaching on something that I'm familiar with. Uh, we usually do this uh, series on Sunday nights, but uh, we won't be having church this evening here. Uh, there'll be something else planned for uh, tonight. And uh, the Sunday school teacher this morning got a real bad sinus infection, so uh, whatever he was going to teach on, I'm not sure, but we're going to be looking at rightly dividing this morning. And uh, bad people in church one time told me they was tired of uh, hearing on rightly dividing. And uh, I, was, I thought to myself, well, then get you somebody in here that's not approved unto God. Because <laughs> yeah. this is in obedience to 2 Timothy 2.15. You better rightly divide the Bible every time you pick it up and read it. Right. Mm -hmm. So whether we title our lessons, a series on rightly dividing or not, every time you open God's Word... You're commanded to rightly divide or you're not approved unto God. Amen. Study, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Plain and simple. That's a command on how you're to handle God's word. Amen. So we've been doing a series on rightly dividing. And it's like I told you before, when I start this series, every time I teach on this series, uh, for the rest of my life, the Lord will be giving me new things that will fit into this series. And uh, like I told you when I first started it, this is not designed to give you an understanding of everything in God's Word. That's a lifelong work that will never be finished till the day a man dies. You're trying to understand the mind of God when you open this book. Right. Amen. And I'm telling you, you'll never achieve a full understanding of that until you're conformed into the image of Jesus Christ at His appearing. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we will be like Him. Right. Okay, so this is not designed to give you a full understanding of God's Word. It is designed to give you methods and techniques on how you are to approach God's Word. Uh, these are divisions in God's Word that God has given me. The first three or four lessons in this series, we covered the divisions between the body, soul, and spirit. And what a body, soul, and spirit of a man is when he's born naturally into this world in Adam's image, he's born with a dead spirit to God. He's alienated from the life of God. And then through the preaching of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, he can become born again or alive unto God. And the Holy Spirit comes in and does a bunch of things in that man. He, he separates him from his flesh, circumcises him with the circumcision made without hands, uh, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh through Christ. And that's a literal thing that happens. You got guys all over this planet trying to determine a person's salvation based on what they see in their flesh. Right. It's like I tell them all the time, lost people change the habits that they consider evidence of salvation. Okay, but that was the first divisions we looked at. The difference in the body, soul, and spirit. You cannot look at a man's flesh and determine anything spiritual about that man. Uh, amen. The Bible says that the, 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 uh, the ministers of Satan have transformed themselves into the ministers of righteousness. You need to talk to a man for a really long time before you get a good idea of where he's coming from yeah. spiritually. It's not based on what he does, it's based on what he says. That's what 1 John said. Try the spirits, whether they be of God. They speak of the world, therefore the world heareth them. We are of God, he that heareth God heareth our word. Right. You don't know what a man, spirit a man's under the influence of until you hear him speak. That's what we looked at the first three or four 
series, uh, lessons in this series was the division between the body, soul, and spirit. Uh, the body, soul, and spirit of a lost man, the body, soul, and spirit of a saved man. Then after a man's saved, we look at the different stages in his spiritual growth. He goes from a newborn babe up to a little child, up to a young man, up to a father, up to an elder, up to uh, uh, one that's full of age. <coughs> Able to discern both good and evil because he has his senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He, he, he uh, uh, is able to use the meat of the word. So this week, this morning, I want us to look at another division that needs to be made in God's word. And that's a man's personal righteousness and God's righteousness. Clear distinctions in God's Word and differences between the two. Amen. We're going to look at some of those the distinctions this morning and show you that they are different. They're not the same. If right. they're not the same, you can't make them the same. Amen. Right. I get tired of people putting things in God's Word that's not there because that's what they think in their own understanding. Right. I had a man the other day that was arguing with me about... Uh, uh, evidence of salvation and uh, he said that no liar shall inherit the kingdom of God and I told him I said thank you for making inherit the same word as salvation right right <clears throat> inheriting the kingdom of God is not the same thing as being saved Inherit and saved are not the same things. You can't make them the same. Take God for what He said. Amen. You spend your life lying and cheating and stealing, I guarantee you, you will not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean you won't be saved and have shame for eternity because you lived as a saved man like the devil. Now, turn to Romans chapter 10. I want to look at the differences in personal righteousness and God's righteousness. The Apostle Paul said, We are they that worship God in spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. I have no confidence in the flesh. None whatsoever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What does that tell us? They're unsaved. They're unsaved. They were lost. As a nation, Israel was lost. Okay? For I bear who? Them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You can have all the zeal in the world. You can go out and street preach every weekend. You can read your Bible 12 hours out of every day and be on what you would consider is on fire for God and be completely out of God's will. Amen. That's right. Here's a group of people that had a zeal of God, but guess what? It wasn't according to knowledge. It was ignorant zeal. Amen. How do I know that? Next verse. For they being ignorant. People get so offended by the word ignorant. You, you say, well, you're ignorant. They just get so offended. Okay? 
The only thing the word ignorant means is that you're without the knowledge of something. Right. right. Do you know how much I'm ignorant of? The only way reason you should ever get offended at the word ignorant is if you think you're a know-it-all. Yeah. Amen. I'm ignorant of all kinds of things in this world. And my, the vast majority of people living today are ignorant Amen. of what's really going on. Amen. For they, Israel, being ignorant of what? God's righteousness. They were ignorant of this one. And going about to establish their own righteousness, they are not the same. They were ignorant of God's. They were going about to establish their own. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And I want you to notice this. I meant to put this timeline up here this morning. I forgot to. Here's Calvary. Here's the birth of Christ. Here's his ascension. His ministry started somewhere in here at about 30 years old. And the Bible says there, for Christ is the end of what? The law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Right. What's that tell me about somebody that's trying to establish their salvation through the works of the law? They don't believe. Right. They can call themselves believers all they want to, but the Bible tells you that Jesus Christ was the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So if they're trying to use the law to establish their righteousness, they're unbelievers. Amen. They're infidels. Something else that tells me is that there was a time that the law was for righteousness. Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Amen. The end of it. So don't tell me it never existed. Now, Paul's prayer, prayer for Israel here was that they might be saved. They had a zeal, but zeal doesn't equal salvation. Their zeal was not according to knowledge. How was their knowledge wrong? They were ignorant of God's righteousness. And because they were ignorant of God's righteousness, they were not aware of God's righteousness. Therefore, they set forth to establish their own righteousness. Because of this, they failed to submit themselves under the righteousness of God. There's something that you have to submit to before you can attain the righteousness of God. And that's one of the hardest things for mankind to do in this world is to submit to another authority. Right. Men are the most unsubmissive creatures that God made. Amen. They run around in this life and everything they do is contrary to the order and will of God. They're submitted to their own authority. You have to submit to something before you can attain the righteousness of God. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. If Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, then there was a time when the law was for righteousness. That's clear. Yeah. Right. Unless you lean to your own understanding, that's what these scriptures say. I didn't take anything out. I didn't put anything in. I just simply told you what these first four verses in chapter 4 or chapter 9, 10 of Romans says. That's all I did. But personal righteousness ended at Christ. Amen. Amen. You say, well, I don't believe they had righteousness under the law. Well, then turn to the book of Luke. You're going to be without excuse after we look at some scripture this morning. And the only way you're going to be able to get out of what this teaches is if you just tell God that he's, he don't know what he's talking about. 
and your own understanding goes at war with the wisdom of God. Amen. Luke chapter 1. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Amen. What's the context of their righteousness in that verse? The fact that they was walking. Huh? Read uh, Romans 10, 5. Back to Romans 10, 5. Yeah, I didn't uh, include this, but I mean, we should have. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Two different righteousness right there in those two verses. Right. The righteousness which Moses described that was of the law and the righteousness which was of faith. But back to uh, the book of Luke chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 the context of Zacharias and Elizabeth's righteousness is the context that they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord and were blameless. Amen. That's the context. And you'll read that to me in it. I mean, I, I get so tired of it. I sit there and I argue with this group of people that works in this dispensation has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I'm arguing with people that thinks that it was by grace through faith and not of works all through God's word. Right. <clears throat> the context here is that Zacharias and Elizabeth had a righteousness which was of the law. They walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, and they were blameless. Nobody said their sins were taken away. Nobody said they were justified in the sight of God. They did what God told them, and God had allowed that to be for their righteousness. You don't believe me? Let's keep going. Their righteousness came from walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. They were blameless. They had a personal righteousness. A righteousness that pertained to the flesh. Yeah. Amen. But there shall no flesh be justified in His sight. Amen. That's why when they died, they had to go and wait for their sins to be taken away. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. For we, verse 3, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now notice this. <laughs> These guys think that they was as good as the Apostle Paul. A lot of them. Why? Because they get out the street preach. <clears throat> what about them guys that get out on the corners of New York City it's raining. The guys that get out in, on the street corner of New York City with the big signs that hang around their neck says the end is coming. Yeah. That's the only thing they ever say. The end is coming. They're street preaching. What message are they preaching though? For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit rejoice in Christ Jesus have no confidence in the flesh. Now the Apostle Paul is going to lay out his confidence in the flesh. And what gets me is these are a bunch of Gentiles running around 
thinking that they're just in the will of God because they go out street preach every weekend. The Apostle Paul, let's look at his, what he had to boast about. Right. He said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Any other man that thinks he has something to boast about in his flesh, <clears throat> about the fact that he hasn't sinned in quite some time, had a guy tell me that here recently. I haven't sinned in quite some time. I said, I'll lay $200 down right now that you've sinned today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You tell me everything you've done today, I'll find something. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even the Holy Spirit that discerns the intents and thoughts of the heart. Yeah. Paul said, though I might also have confidence in flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So let's see what the Apostle Paul had to boast about. Circumcised the eighth day. Most of these guys running around thinking they have confidence in their flesh probably circumcised the second or third day in a hospital somewhere. Yeah. Gentiles circumcised the second or third day contrary to God's law. Right. Of the stock of Israel, that eliminates 9.9 .9 out of every 10 of them you're going to run into and debate with. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Paul even knew exactly what tribe he was from. <laughs> and Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, well, he was just talking about the traditional oral law of the Pharisees. He mentions two laws here. Right. He said it's touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Same exact wording it used about Zacharias and Elizabeth. Touching the righteousness which was of the law, <coughs> Paul was blameless. I heard somebody put it like this. If the Apostle Paul would have died under the Old Testament dispensation, he probably would have been saved. Yeah. He was blameless. Right. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now notice this. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Everything I have to boast about, Paul said, he said, I count it all as dung, that I may have the excellency of the knowledge of Him. Amen. And be found in Him, in Him, in Him. That's where it all happens, man, is in Amen. Him. That's right. And they miss it. Well, if I don't see the fruit or the evidence of someone's salvation, I don't have any confidence that they're saved. Paul said, This only would I know of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? If no man hath the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect through the flesh? Right. Where was their beginning? They begun in the Spirit. Right. And they receive and begin in the Spirit by the hearing of faith. Amen. Be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God 
by faith. Paul's own personal righteousness, which was by law, and the righteousness of God, which is of God, the righteousness of God, which is through the faith of who? Not my faith, the faith of Christ. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. I ain't never had a doubt I was saved since I learned this stuff right here. Yeah. I used to get, I used to twist and turn and pull and tug and doubt. And I learned all this stuff here, how to rightly divide this, and how that it's his faith that Amen. justifies me. Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. When I learned that stuff right there, man, peace. How do I know that's of God? Because the Bible says He's not given us a spirit of fear, Amen. but of peace and of a sound mind. Yeah. What does that tell you about these guys running around trying to put fear in the hearts of believers? Right. When you start calling them out on this stuff, they start calling you names. They don't even know you personally and they'll start accusing you of justifying sin and being carnal and everything else. That's the spirit of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Amen. Amen. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Philippians chapter 3, go on to verse 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, that he may know him and the power of his resurrection. Let me tell you something else that helped me in my life. What Something else that helped me in my life is when I come to realize that all of my efforts in overcoming the sin that was in my flesh was an utter failure and when I learned the truth, the gospel truth, that when I accepted what Christ did for me at Calvary, that God buried me with Him, crucified me with Him, buried with me, me with Him, and raised me with Him, and seated me in heaven with Him, and when I realized that that's my standing, Amen. that's when sin became, began to be mortified in my flesh. Right. Amen. And that's how it works. Peter said, not the putting off of the field of the flesh, but of the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's only when you start learning these truths that the true righteousness, which is instilled in us through the Spirit of God living in us, can begin to manifest itself in the outer appearance. Amen. You're running around giving people false hope in their flesh. <laughs> How many times I gotta say it? Lost people make the changes these guys are advocating. Right. As right. evidence yeah. of salvation. Lost people give the charities. Lost people get tired of being drunks and clean up and quit drinking. Lost people get tired of spending every dime they get on drugs and quit using drugs. Get tired of allowing their bodies to be used and quit selling them in prostitution. Lost people do these things. That does not mean they have ever come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. So how can you look at these things and determine, well, that person really got saved. They must have really repented. Philippians chapter 3, I don't think it's hard to understand. There's a clear distinction there between a man's personal righteousness and the righteousness of God. Right. Paul was blameless 
in his own righteousness, which was of law, he was blameless. But he counted it as done. A big stinking pile of poop. In layman's terms, that's what he counted as if he could be found in Christ not having his own righteousness which was by the law, but the righteousness of God which was by faith of Christ. Amen. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. The definition of the word righteousness is meeting the standard of what is right and just. Under the law, men had their own personal righteousness. Moses described that righteousness over in Romans chapter 10. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, saying, The man that doeth those things shall live by them. Ezekiel chapter 3. Well, I just don't believe that preacher because the Bible says by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. Yeah, in his sight. Yeah. Right. Justified and righteousness are not the two words, same words. Amen. Quit interchanging words without God telling you to interchange words. Being justified is not the same thing as having righteousness. Being justified is being declared righteous. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not the same. <clears throat> Under the law, men have their own personal righteousness. Ezekiel chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 20, God says, Again, when a righteous man doth turn from whose righteousness? His. His righteousness. Not God's righteousness. His righteousness. And commit iniquity. And I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, not God's righteousness, his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, <clears throat> if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not and he doth not sin he shall surely live because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul man turns from his righteousness righteousness which is something he did he dies in his sin the righteousness that he hath Done shall not be remembered. Amen. That's what it said. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Personal righteousness was by works. Doing something. You try to get them to address these scriptures. Somebody that refuses to rightly divide. They're really just people that won't acknowledge God said what he said in certain places. The way we teach the Bible, the whole thing gets in harmony. The whole Word of God becomes har receives harmony. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that these, this righteousness is as filthy rags before God. It doesn't mean they didn't have it. Just before God, it was filthy rags. <clears throat> like I told you a second ago, we'll close here in about five minutes. The word justified means to be declared righteous. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 11 tells us but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Justified and righteousness are not the same words. I just showed you the scriptures where a man had his own personal righteousness, which was by the law, which was because he did certain things. 
But because he couldn't be justified and declared righteous, God had sacrifices. Every day, slice, slice, slit the throats of these animals. Blood, 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 blood. What was that doing? That was righteousness. They had to do that before they were righteous. Shed that blood. Mm -hmm. A man could have righteousness under the law. This righteousness was his own and it was by works. I just showed you. But in God's sight, he was filthy, could not be justified. Hebrews chapter 12. different people here. I'll close with this and we'll pick this up next time. Hebrews chapter 12 look at starting with verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. You don't understand what this is talking about? Go back and read the story in Exodus. When the children of Israel was led out by Moses and they came to the mountain and Moses set up a meeting between God and the people. And when they heard God speak, they said, Moses, you go up and talk to him from now on. We don't want to hear that voice anymore. Amen. Right. Scared them to death. Amen. That's what people do today. Yeah. They hear you talk about the God, God's word and preach God's word straight off the pages. Go away. Yeah. We don't want to hear it anymore. You have a pig roast down the road yesterday at a church. I bet you there was 50 cars parked outside that church. What we got here this morning? Six? Seven? That makes me feel safe, man. Broadway, narrow way, many, few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I don't go with the crowd. Why? Because people are dumb animals. That's why. By nature. Right. For they cannot endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. You're not coming to that mountain. Now this is a book written to Hebrews. And before I go into any in-depth doctrinal application on who this is applying to, I just want you to see who it's talking about dwells in the mountain that he's talking about that they are come to. He says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Yeah. We're not talking about the mountain that sits over the Middle East. We're talking about the one that sits in heaven. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly. There's a general assembly in heaven. It's just general. Who knows what makes that assembly up? Who knows? We're talking about a spiritual kingdom. Right. The kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, there's a general assembly. Okay. Let your imagination go wild for a little while. And the church of the firstborn. There's a church up there too. Yeah. This is the church of the firstborn. So Hebrews is written to somebody that's not yet 
that is completely separate from a church that is in heaven. <laughs> Why? Because who this is written to has come to that mountain where there's a church dwelling there. Right. Yeah. And they're being warned how they can be saved. So they're evidently going to be saved differently than a church that's already there. They're not the same group of people <clears throat> which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all. Notice this one, and I'm going to close. And the spirits of just men, men, men made perfect. They were already just, but something made them perfect. And to Jesus, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. These are different groups of people. And the next week, the next time we teach this series, we're going to look at some of the ways you can tell the difference in them. You get over to the book of Revelation, and every word the word saint is used, they want to interchange it with the body of Christ. Yeah. There are other saints that are going to be in that kingdom and in the new heaven and new earth that are not necessarily members of the body of Christ. Yeah. You get in that body by the one baptism of the Spirit. But you don't get into the kingdom that way. Right. If you miss out on the greatest offer God ever made to man, you're going to have to impress God to be able to live in the kingdom that his righteous son rules in. Amen. There ain't going to be no gays and all this nonsense running around under no authority whatsoever. Amen. Absolutely. He's getting, coming to subdue and get rid of everything that offends the kingdom of God. Right. <clears throat> Next week, we'll start looking at some of these differences in these different groups of men. You get over in Revelation, some of them says they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You have some over there, just like the just spirits of just men made perfect, they wash their own robes clean in the blood of the Lamb, and then there's another group of people that it's granted right. unto them Amen. that they should be arrayed in fine linen, right. clean and white. 